Chapter 6, Compassion Franklin has spent seven years convalescing. Eleanor's support, along with Franklin's political team, leads to Franklin becoming governor of New York in 1928. Eleanor, happy for Franklin's success, does not let his new position overshadow her personal goals and ambitions. She keeps her own schedule and earns her own money. She does not revert back to being a completely colorless echo. Part of Eleanor's color is she now recognizes her joy in giving as an essential part of her being. Both personally and publicly, her compassion reaches out to fill hearts and homes that are struggling. Living up to her intention to ignore the gossip and dictates of society, she champions for the rights of blacks, Jews, women, and children. Building alliances and friendships, she enjoys the company of women who are feminists and activists, many in long-standing lesbian relationships. With the Democratic Convention, 1932, and the possibility of Franklin becoming president, Eleanor dreads the thought of losing this life she has made for herself. If she is to become the First Lady to the United States, Eleanor knows the public scrutiny of her independent life, her friends, and being outspoken for unpopular causes will be brutal. She is terrified and writes in a letter to a friend that she could not live in the White House. But it doesn't matter. In November, Franklin wins the election. Eleanor is asked if her life will now belong to the public after this. Eleanor replies, it never has and never could. A quote of Eleanor's is, friendship with oneself is all important because without it, one cannot be friends with anyone else in the world. When asked to visit the White House prior to moving in, Eleanor turns down the offer for the White House car and a military aid to pick her up. Her plans are to arrive by train the night before and in the morning walk to the White House. In spite of this, the chief of protocol for the State Department shows up at the hotel with the limousine. Eleanor sticks to her guns. She and her friend walk to the White House. The friend, Lorena Hickok, finally known to Eleanor as Hick, is an Associated Press reporter who is assigned to cover Eleanor during the presidential campaign. Hick's devotion and friendship is a source of strength and a shoulder to lean on through the years ahead as they escape the intrusive glare of D.C. with getaway weekends and hikes in Yosemite Park. For the inauguration, Franklin has it in mind for everyone to go by train. Eleanor announces she would load her roadster with belongings and drive down with a woman friend, being Hick. Franklin insists Eleanor go with his entourage. Eleanor relents. In the morning hours before the inauguration, Eleanor takes Hick to Rock Creek Cemetery. Wanting to share with a friend a part of her painful past, they sit at the Statue of Grief. Eleanor may be back in D.C. again, but she is not the same woman, and she is not alone. As First Lady, Eleanor learns to stay true to herself and to the people who need her help. For the hundreds of invitations she receives, she realizes it is really the position which is invited, and not the person. She knows that officials do not want to meet her, Eleanor, but the wife of the president. Eleanor is enjoying setting new standards and challenging overprotective rules. When Amelia Earhart comes to town in her airplane, Eleanor goes up for a ride at night. The New York Times reports, the first lady of the land and the first woman to fly the Atlantic Ocean went skylarking together tonight in a big condor plane. Eleanor thought nothing of dismissing police sent to guard her at public events or dismissing the elevator usher at the White House. When she opens the door for the elevator, she is told by the usher that the elevator is run only by doormen and not by her. Eleanor gets in the elevator by herself. While closing the door, she gives him this reply. Now it is. In the first 12 months at the White House, she receives over 300,000 pieces of mail. At one engagement, she shakes hands with 3,100 people in one and a half hours. Her demeanor is a far cry from her earlier years when she ran upstairs to hide from a few guests. In the first year as First Lady, 1933, this is the record of people with whom she meets. 
For meals, 4,729. Overnight guests, 323. Tea guests, 9,211. Received, 14,056. A total of 28,319 people. Several hundred more can be added to this number since, aside from this, she travels and gives 45 paid lectures that year. It is understood she is not the one that cooked the meals, changed the bedsheets, or shopped for groceries. Instead, she maintains her gracious manners as she shakes thousands of hands, greets people warmly, carries on conversation, and indulgently overlooks boorish guests vying to impress her. Changing sheets would be an easy day. Her early awkwardness and insecurities vanish, to the point where she can say, 400 will be quite easy to have for tea. And to keep up with this pace, Eleanor does suggest that, after every 500 guests, take a sip of water. With the official duties under control, Eleanor is learning to use the leverage that her position provides. She is constantly reminding the public about the plight of people around them. She uses her My Day newspaper column to broaden the horizons of her readers and help open their eyes to the suffering of others. In today's terms, this would be comparable to Michelle Obama having a daily blog. Imagine Eleanor with a Facebook page. Once unable to stand and make a public appeal for money, she now shows no qualms about making an audience gasp at the New York Metropolitan Opera. Between Act 1 and 2, Eleanor gets up and walks onto the stage. She faces the audience to make a request for money on behalf of those struck by the Depression. She explains to the audience, when you come face to face with people in need, you simply have to try to do something about it. Eleanor also becomes savvier when dealing with the media. She has the inside help of her friend Hick. Eleanor not only conducts her own press conferences, she flaunts the men-only rule at press conferences with Franklin, making hers only for women journalists. Since newspapers want to carry stories about Eleanor, this policy gives job assurance for many female reporters. What critics deem conniving, Eleanor sees as leveling the playing field. A quote that Eleanor used, looking back on these years again about being in the press, she says, My grandmother had taught me that a woman's place was not in the public eye, and that idea had clung to me all through the Washington year. Her press conferences make great stories for the journalists because Eleanor will bring up controversial topics. She tells them, Sometimes I say things which I thoroughly understand are likely to cause unfavorable comments in some quarters, and perhaps you newspaper women think I should keep them off the record. What you don't understand is that perhaps I am making these statements on purpose to arouse controversy and thereby get the topics talked about and so get people to thinking about them. Eleanor's ability to combat head games is not what wins over the hearts of people. It is her abundant compassion that warms thousands of lives. Like sunshine on the vineyards of Napa Valley, the following examples represent only a few of the grapes. Compassion on a personal level. Eleanor arranges for a 14-year-old girl, Bertha, to receive medical care. Bertha is in the hospital for 10 months. During that time, Eleanor sends flowers, gifts, and notes. Eleanor keeps in touch with Bertha, signing her diploma. Helps her get a job, finds Bertha's brother a job, attends Bertha's wedding, and is the godmother to her child. Eleanor quotes, Whatever comes your way is yours to handle. Eleanor finds out the police have chased away the peanut vendor that has always stationed his cart near the White House. Although sick in bed, she writes a note to have this matter resolved. I would myself miss him on that corner. We had better let him stand at the White House again. During her stay as First Lady, Eleanor says, My feeling about the White House is that it belongs to the people, their taxes support it. It is theirs. And as far as possible, they should be made to feel welcome here. During her 13 years in residence, she has hundreds of overnight guests. In 1936, she asks a couple dozen women from the Women's Trade Union League to stay at the White House. 
It is the first time working women have been White House guests. As a thoughtful gesture, Eleanor makes sure a New York City dressmaker is given the Lincoln bedroom. The woman exclaims, Imagine me, Fieli Shapiro, sleeping in Lincoln's bed. For the years of suffering during the Depression, there are plenty of opportunities to help people. One time, when Eleanor stops at a gas station, a man approaches her and asks for money. She asks him why he doesn't go to the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, that provides jobs. He tells her they don't accept people without a home address. Eleanor gives him her card with her New York City address and $10. She invites him to dinner the following Monday. The man, Al Crest, shows up. Eleanor puts in a call to the CCC and then informs Al he can start work tomorrow. She asks Al if he has a place to sleep tonight. Al says no, and Eleanor lets him stay at her apartment. Al does well at the CCC and keeps in touch with Eleanor. She has Al and his parents to the White House for dinner. They correspond for years, and Eleanor becomes the godmother to his daughter. A quote of Eleanor's is, Do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticized anyway. You'll be damned if you do, and damned if you don't. In April 1936, as First Lady, she is the chair for the Washington Committee on Housing, and the Southern Democrats are outraged. Eleanor has invited Negroes. During her speech, Eleanor's empathy of the race issues so moves an African-American woman that she, quote, had to retire in tears because she was so touched by the understanding and sympathy for her race that was expressed by Mrs. Roosevelt's manner as well as her speech, end quote. In 1939, Eleanor writes about traveling by train through Tennessee, She relays a scene out her window, not as a sterile reporter giving hollow facts, but with insight to a child's world. I saw a little girl, slim and bent over, carrying two heavy pails of water across a field to an unpainted house. How far that water had to be carried, I do not know, but it is one thing to carry water on a camping trip for fun during a summer's holiday and it's another thing to carry it day in and day out as a part of the routine of living. And her compassion and work ethics don't end as she gets older. When she is in her 70s and could be slowing down, she says she will do a television commercial for margarine. She is disregarding the unwritten code to be dignified and traditional. She figures with the money she can earn, $35,000, She can save 6,000 lives with care packages. And this last example is classic Eleanor. At 75, she is a world-renowned stateswoman. She's in New York City on her way to a charity meeting to give a speech. As she is leaving her hairdresser, an African-American youth backs his car into her and knocks her down. This being 1959, Eleanor doesn't want to chance a racial incident and tells the young man to hurry on before people can gather. She wants to keep her schedule of speaking at the charity, but first her doctor tapes up her torn ligaments. She goes to the engagement at the Waldorf Astoria and apologizes to her audience for having to make her speech while sitting on a pillow. Eleanor says to her doctor later, People saw that I was in pain and we raised more money. Eleanor is often admonished for doing too much for people. She responds, whatever comes your way is yours to handle. And I do not attempt to judge others by my standards. In her book, You Learn by Living, she writes, charitable organizations and hospitals, poverty and pain. These exist, alas, everywhere. Their needs are enormous beyond calculation. But there are others less dramatic, though no less real. There is loneliness within reach of your outstretched arm. There is unhappiness that requires, perhaps, only understanding and a fortifying word. There is hunger and sickness and despair somewhere in your neighborhood. Compassion on a nationwide level. Eleanor is adamant that compassion does not mean handouts. She says, 
I get panicky every now and then about these people having work. She wants it understood. Charity may be necessary. However, our aim should be to get people back to a point where they can look after themselves. I have never felt that people should be grateful for charity. They should rightfully be resentful, and so should we look at the circumstances which make charity a necessity. By the 1930s, the extent of the Great Depression on hardworking Americans exposes that the American facade of rugged individualism is cracking apart. Society has become so entwined with a complex economy that its collapse has more serious consequences than in earlier years. Eleanor sees this and says, We have believed in the individualistic thing. We can't go on that way. We must work together on big things. Providing social security is one of the big things. Her commitment for this financial support to family life is evident when she explains low-income families had done what good citizens should do, and they simply had never been able to save. There had always been someone in the family who needed help, some young person to start. When she receives bad press for wanting federal money spent on social programs, Eleanor counters with, We spend a great deal of money every year to improve various crops and fruits and vegetables. It seems to me that the time has arrived when a certain amount of money should be spent on an experimental station for improving social conditions. As of 1925, $200 million is spent annually for industrial and government research for companies like American Telegraph and Telephone, GE, and DuPont. This and other New Deal jobs, such as construction, traditionally go to white men. Eleanor argues, There is something fundamentally wrong with a civilization which tolerates conditions such as many of our people are facing today. We talk of a New Deal, and we believe in it, but we will have no New Deal unless some of us are willing to sit down and think this situation out. It may require some drastic changes in our rather settled ideas, and we must not be afraid of them. One idea Eleanor promotes is to support the arts as a means of providing more jobs for minorities. She says, I hope we will be able to look upon art and artists as one of the factors which can be used to draw nations together. We need emotional outlets in this country, and the more artistic people develop, the better it will be for us as a nation. The Federal Theater Project, during the Depression, employs 5,644 people. The Federal Music Program in 1937 employs 16,000 musicians. This includes 163 symphony and concert orchestras, 51 bands, 15 chamber music ensembles, 69 dance orchestras, and 146 teacher projects. Another prospect Eleanor takes a particular interest in is building the town of Arthurdale, West Virginia. This is the first of several planned New Deal resettlement towns designed to take impoverished laborers and move them to newly constructed rural communities, helping them become economically self-sufficient. The First Lady is so enthusiastic about the idea that she brings it to the attention of Franklin, who decides to federalize the project. Eleanor makes monthly visits to Arthurdale. She personally reviews the plans for the houses being built. She listens to and knows the individual concerns of the families. She hands out diplomas at graduation. When there aren't enough funds to pay the teachers, Eleanor gives her own money. Measures of success for New Deal programs can be difficult to assess. Turning despair into aspirations doesn't directly show up on economic charts, especially if politics and deprivation of federal funds deter the economic stability of jobs. The local citizens also have their own resistance to change. The Arthurdale community vote to make their town whites only. In 1994, at the 60-year celebration of Arthurdale, the citizens had moved from being unemployed coal mining families to a generation of teachers, doctors, lawyers, artists, and military men and women. To commemorate the anniversary, residents wore sweatshirts with the words, Arthurdale, the dream lives on. Chapter 7, Causes 
Eleanor is relentless in her efforts to break any social conventions that are based on the subjugation of others. During her lifetime, children are tied to benches, laboring through 14-hour days. Women working in a locked factory room will burn to death in a fire. Jews who have escaped genocide are denied entrance to American shores. And on display in a barbershop window is the memento of the last lynching, nigger knuckles in a jar. What now smacks as atrocious were justified practices, sacred cows of American society. It is no surprising coincidence that people who benefit from these prejudices are among Eleanor's critics. She says of those who disapprove, I suppose when one is being forced to realize that an unwelcome change is coming, one must blame it on someone or something. She reminds us, You can't move so fast that you try to change the mores faster than people can accept it. That doesn't mean you do nothing but it means that you do the things that need to be done according to priority. Eleanor's array of causes for which she championed has filled books. This chapter highlights her advocacy for three groups, African Americans, women, and Jews. African Americans. Our Civil War, which put an end to slavery and an end to 970,227 lives, was a cataclysmic turning point for our nation. During Eleanor's lifetime, the wounded from this war still hobble down the streets. Abe Lincoln's son is still alive, and children hear from grandmothers wistful antebellum stories about their good life and their good slaves. Eleanor's paternal grandmother was one of them, and Eleanor has her own prejudices to work through. During the first move to D.C. in 1913, Eleanor, 29, has brought with her family the white servants. This doesn't comply with Southern traditions, so she replaces them with African Americans. Eleanor writes in a letter, Well, all my servants are gone, and all the darkies are here, and heaven knows how it will turn out. Years later, Eleanor corrects herself. She writes an apology for her poor choice of words in her autobiography, I am terribly sorry if the use of the word darky offends. The social climate for the early 1900s includes increased riots and lynchings against African Americans. Two dominant reasons are, one, the economy. White and black veterans coming back from World War I have no jobs. And two, the society. African American troops are treated as equals by white Europeans and come back to the United States expecting the same. During the summer of 1919, there are Washington race riots. Eleanor, having taken the children to Campobello for the summer, writes to Franklin, No word from you, and I'm getting very anxious on account of the riots. Do be careful not to be hit by stray bullets. Eleanor makes no mention of compassion for the African-American cause or the victims in the riots. It is ten months after the Mercer affair, and she is still worried whether or not Franklin is faithful. Eleanor's growth through the 1920s prepares her to now be an advocate for African Americans when Franklin becomes president. Having a dinner for the National Council of Women, she includes future longtime friend Mary Jane McLeod Bethune, a prior suffragist, an educator, and leader in the National Association of Colored Women. When Mrs. Bethune, the only black woman in attendance, enters the dining room, it is Sarah Roosevelt who gets up to greet her. Sarah has come some distance of her own toward having respect for African Americans. Mrs. Bethune relates, That grand old lady took my arm and seated me to the right of Eleanor Roosevelt in the seat of honor. I can remember, too, how the faces of the Negro servants lit up with pride when they saw me seated at the center of that imposing gathering. A terrible custom that is still unchallenged well into the 1930s is the right of whites to torture and kill African Americans. In the year 1933 alone, there are 28 lynchings. In fact, from the 1880s through the 1950s, there are over 5,000 lynching murders and not one conviction. When Eleanor becomes First Lady in 1933, 
she is constantly updating Franklin on the unconstitutional treatment of African Americans and is pushing for an anti-lynching law. It is a slow, uphill battle, since Franklin doesn't want to offend the Southern Democratic white voters. Eleanor said, But the courage to go against a sweep of feeling, to be an awkward minority, to stand up and be counted even when it makes one unpopular. To stop this turning a blind eye by the feds and to pressure the government to uphold the constitutional rights for all of its citizens, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, was established in 1909. Walter White is head of the NAACP at the time that Franklin is president, and Mr. White is in constant touch with Eleanor. Eleanor is again urging Franklin to support the anti-lynching bill, but Franklin refuses and uses the excuse of not wanting to violate states' rights. The real reason is Northern Democrats did not want to antagonize Southern Democrats and thereby lose their votes or lose power to the Republicans. The North also has its own levels of racial hatred with its equal level of self-serving stubbornness to change. In 1933, Mr. White sends Eleanor a full report of the most recent lynching of a man, Claude Neal. The lynching, announced ahead of time in newspapers and on the radio, leads to thousands showing up to watch and participate. The event is horrific. As General Patton would make the local Germans go to the concentration camp to bear witness to the atrocities committed to the Jews, Walter White sends this eyewitness account to Eleanor. After taking the nigger to the woods about four miles from Greenwood, they cut off his penis. He was made to eat it. They cut off his testicles and made him eat them and say he liked it. Then they sliced his sides and stomach with knives, and every now and then somebody would cut off a finger or toe. Red-hot irons were used on the nigger to burn him from top to bottom. From time to time during the torture, a rope was tied around Neil's neck, and he was pulled up over a limb and held there until he almost choked to death. Then he was let down, and the torture began all over again. After several hours of this unspeakable torture, they decided just to kill him. Neil's body was tied to a rope on the rear of an automobile and dragged over the highway to the Kennedy home. Here, a mob, estimated to number somewhere between 3,000 and 7,000 people from 11 southern states, was excitedly waiting his arrival. When the car, which was dragging Neil's body, came in front of the Kennedy home, a man who was riding the rear bumper cut the rope. A woman came out of the Kennedy house and drove a butcher knife into his heart. Then the crowd came by and some kicked him and some drove their cars over him. Men, women, and children were numbered in the vast throng that came to witness the lynching. It is reported from reliable sources that the little children, some of them mere tots, who lived in the Greenwood neighborhood, waited with sharpened sticks for the return of Neil's body, and that when it rolled in the dust on the road that awful night, these little children drove their weapons deep into the flesh of the dead man. The body, which by this time was horribly mutilated, was taken to Mariana, a distance of 10 or 11 miles, where it was hung to a tree on the northeast corner of the courthouse square. Pictures were taken of the mutilated form, and hundreds of photographs were sold for 50 cents each. Scores of citizens viewed the body as it hung in the square. The body was perfectly nude until the early morning when someone had the decency to hang a burlap sack over the middle of the body. The body was cut down about 8.30 Saturday morning, October 27, 1934. Fingers and toes from Neil's body have been exhibited as souvenirs in Mariana, where one man offered to divide the finger, which he had with a friend as a special favor. Another man has one of the fingers preserved in alcohol. When Mr. White asks Eleanor why the president doesn't speak out against lynching during the address to Congress later that year, Eleanor writes to White this hollow response. He wants me to say that he was talking to the leaders on the lynching question, and his sentence on crime in his address to Congress touched on that because lynching is a crime. White also asks Eleanor to speak at a protest meeting. Franklin tells Eleanor no, and Eleanor complies. Discussions on whether Eleanor could have done more are valid. It should be remembered. 
She might have a front row seat at the political game, but she is not in the position of a political player to change laws. She must also keep open her small window of opportunity to speak with the president. Eleanor is sickened by these atrocities that are brazenly committed, not in the shadows of our society, but often in broad daylight. She is determined to challenge the entire structure of America's segregated life. To do this, she changes strategy. Rather than go to the president, she goes to the people. What she can do is raise the pressure through increased public awareness so the citizens, not the politicians, will demand change. The following are examples of what she did. For every one of these stories, there are pages more folded away in biographies and historical archives that describe her fight for the end to racial violence and equal rights for all Americans. In the spring of 1934, she helps organize the Washington Conference on Negro Education. Eleanor, as a speaker, says, I think the day of selfishness is over. The day of really working together has come, and we must learn to work together, all of us, regardless of race or creed or color. We go ahead together, or we go down together. That same year, she also helps organize the National Conference on Fundamental Problems in the Education of Negroes. Her bold speech, which is broadcast nationwide, includes, I noticed in the papers this morning the figures given of the cost in certain states per capita for the education of a colored child and of a white child, and I could not help but think how stupid we are. And there are many people in this country, many white people, who have not had the opportunity for education. And there are also many Negroes who have not had the opportunity. Both these conditions should be remedied, and the same opportunity should be accorded to every child, regardless of race or creed. Some of the population is suggesting that, quote, Negroes, end quote, should be happy with what they have, and educating them will only make them ask for more. But Eleanor counters this foolishness with the argument, to deny any part of a population the opportunities for more enjoyment in life, for higher aspirations, is a menace to the nation as a whole. There has been too much concentrating of wealth, and even if it means that some of us have got to learn to be a little more unselfish about sharing what we have than we have in the past, we must realize that it will profit us all in the long run. Eleanor applies this to herself. For years, she gives away most of her earnings from lectures and writing to support the causes for which she is fighting. Eleanor encourages the public to open their eyes and see that this injustice is a matter of their own national security. The nation cannot expect the colored people to feel that the U.S. is worth defending if they continue to be treated as they are treated now. This argument will be even stronger when later in the U.N. it is difficult for the U.S. to expect Russia to uphold any human rights standards when Russia can point to our own blatant disregard for the human rights of African Americans. She opposes the Navy policy, which keeps its African-American enlistees in the servile support jobs of mess stewards, cooks, waiters. When an angry man accuses Eleanor of agitating the races to push for more, she responds, I'm not agitating the race question. The race question is agitated because people will not act justly and fairly toward each other as human beings. And she more than once reminds these accusers, you must remember that the president is their president also. Eleanor's words that apply to African Americans fighting for our country are timeless and could apply to the current drama of accepting gays in the military. She writes in her column, I wonder if I can transmit to you the feeling which I have so strongly. In a nation such as ours, every man who fights for us is in some way our man. His parents may be of any race or religion, but if that man dies side by side with all of his buddies, and if your heart is with any man, in some way it must be with all. On the home front, she pushes the Democratic Party to make the New Deal policies open for African Americans and vote 
for the anti-lynching laws. To leverage her cause, she points out how the Republicans use this glaring weakness against the Democrats. They point out, 5,000 Americans have been lynched in the last 50 years in this great free country of ours that is supposed to be the most civilized in the world. The rest of the world laughs at us every time we say we stand for justice and law and order. This point of the national reputation is well taken and referred to even by Hitler. In 1933, he states, We merely wish to state that the United States possesses rigorous immigration laws while Germany has absolutely none so far. We further point to American relations with Negroes, social and political. When the Nazis see Franklin not fight for anti-lynching or stop segregation laws, they feel safe to announce a national boycott of Jewish businesses and professions. How can the United States issue any statement of condemnation to Germany when we are the ones murdering African-American citizens just for wanting to vote? So Eleanor can be credited with being one of the first to recognize the global impact of denying categories of our American citizens their rights. She worries that we will be on par with Nazism, which we fight and makes us tremble for what human beings may do when they no longer think but feel themselves be dominated by their worst emotions. Eleanor writes later in her My Day column in 1962, When unthinking emotions are aroused, we usually find that whatever prejudices are held are channeled by the emotions into expressions that had nothing to do with reality, but simply are an outlet for the prejudices. Eleanor is also insisting that the law, separate but equal, is not right. The basic fact of segregation, which warps and twists the lives of our Negro population, was itself discriminatory. Eleanor starts integrating wherever possible. Much to the dismay of her Hudson Valley neighbors, this includes them. When a few of these elite ladies are asked to lunch at Eleanor's Valkyrie home, they are pleased to think they will be sipping tea with one of their own, who happens to be First Lady of the United States. They are stunned by what happens next. One of the women reports, We thought it would be a nice small intimate party and give us a chance to talk with Eleanor. Before we knew it, a delegation of 200 ladies arrived, colored. When Eleanor visits Franklin at his home in Warm Springs, Georgia, the white residents are not fond of Eleanor and quickly acknowledge, We did not like her a bit. She ruined every maid we ever had. This Southern sentiment held true for some citizens in Birmingham, Alabama, too. In November 1938, Eleanor is the keynote speaker for the biracial Southern Conference on Human Welfare. Police official Eugene Bull Connor, infamous for his later part in the Birmingham riots and arresting Martin Luther King Jr., hears African Americans and whites are sitting side by side in the audience. He comes to the conference each day to enforce the law of segregation. Eleanor, not wanting to relinquish the fight by sitting on the white side, takes a folding chair and sits in the aisle. The absurd shrillness of the white's fear of mixing is apparent when the South uses as evidence of Eleanor's impropriety a Detroit photo of Eleanor shown with an African American. Is Eleanor kissing this person? Holding hands with this person? Dancing? No. The photo is of Eleanor leaning over and smiling at a small African-American girl. The child is handing Eleanor a bouquet of flowers. To commemorate the improvement in society's attitude, this photo went on to become a 32-cent stamp in 1984. The response from African-Americans to Eleanor's simple gracious act is, they know not what they do, these race baiters and exploiters of unreason, and you render deep service to the enduring values of civilization by serving the nation as an historic example of simple humanity in the highest place. In contrast are letters from the white end of the spectrum. The influence you are having on the Negroes may do great harm to this nation. 
you are making them feel they are equal to the white race. You may not believe in amalgamation of the races, but they do not know that. When the North and South are looking to blame someone for the race riots in Detroit the summer of 1943, the Jackson Daily News writes that Eleanor is morally responsible for the riot and, it is blood on your hands, Mrs. Roosevelt, adding, you have been personally proclaiming and practicing social equality at the White House and wherever you go, Mrs. Roosevelt. What followed is not history. A resident of Detroit writes to the president, It is my belief Mrs. Roosevelt and Mayor Jeffries of Detroit are somewhat guilty of the race riots due to their coddling of Negroes. As the First Lady, Eleanor showcases a variety of artists to give concerts at the White House. In 1936, this includes the world-famous contralto Marian Anderson, an African-American. Three years later, the Daughters of the American Revolution, D.A.R., deny Marian Anderson permission to sing for an integrated audience at the Constitution Hall. Eleanor, a member of the D.A.R., resigns. She does this as a public protest. What Eleanor writes in her column shows the consideration of her decision. The question is, if you belong to an organization and disapprove of an action which is typical of a policy, shall you resign, or is it better to work for a changed point of view within the organization? In the past, when I was able to work actively in any organization to which I belonged, I've usually stayed in until I had at least made a fight and been defeated. Even then, I have as a rule accepted my defeat and decided either that I was wrong or that I was perhaps a little too far ahead of the thinking of the majority of that time. I have often found that the thing in which I was interested was done some years later. But in this case, I belong to an organization in which I can do no active work. They have taken an action which has been widely talked of in the press. To remain as a member implies approval of that action, and therefore I am resigning. Eleanor's plan is to increase public awareness and bring about change through the citizens. Not only is she achieving this goal, but after her DAR resignation, a Gallup poll shows that Eleanor has a 67% approval rating. Marian Anderson goes on to perform at an open-air concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for a crowd of 75,000 people. Amidst threats on her life, Ms. Anderson is unafraid to sing these poignant words, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain's side, let freedom ring. Eleanor has given the event her support and yet chooses not to attend. This author hopes she regretted that decision. Eleanor's weekly column is relentless in striving to educate and enlighten. She asks her readers whether they could appreciate being forced to use segregated hospital facilities of lesser quality. Suppose we white people were taken ill in those areas of the world and this type of segregation were practiced against us. Her point-blank tactics can be unnerving to the perpetrators who are caught on her radar. She spares no punches when she says, I can only say I felt mortified that in the North we still have a club, the West Side Tennis Club, which is not ashamed to say that it bars Jews and Negroes from membership. But how can we in the North ask of the South the sacrifices that we are now asking if we countenance this kind of snobbish discrimination? If you can't play tennis with Negroes, how come you are willing to let them be drafted into your army and die for you? I am ashamed for my white people. I am one of them, and their stupidity and cruelty make me cringe. She also uses her calm to voice her appreciation. I would like to speak in praise of those white people in the South who have long fought for the rights of all their fellow citizens. They are probably being made to suffer more than any of us in the North can imagine at the present time. In the 50s, the days of sit-ins and boycotts, Eleanor says, 
I think everyone must be impressed by the dignity and calmness with which the boycott of the bus companies in Montgomery, Alabama, has been carried on by the Negroes. Gandhi's theory of nonviolence seems to have been learned very well. Eleanor's role in desegregation also applies to guests at the White House. She expects her seamstress, an African-American woman, to come through the front door. She invites a group of 60 girls, the majority being African-American, to a garden party. When Eleanor's personal friend, Mary McLeod Bethune, is coming up the sidewalk, Eleanor goes out to greet her, kissing her cheek and taking her arm. Eleanor helps finance and promote summer seminars and camps for African-American girls. She writes letters of recommendation for African-Americans to be appointed to jobs, and when Franklin has a new school for white children built in Warm Springs, Eleanor helps raise money for a school for the African-American children of Warm Springs. In 1950, Eleanor is pleased to announce, In the future, the blood donor card will no longer designate whether blood given is white, Negro, or Oriental. The Board of Governors announced this decision. Scientists have been urging this for some time, since it is a well-known fact that human blood is alike, regardless of race. She understands and lives by her words. Human beings had rights as human beings. Women's rights. The battle for the individual rights of women is one of long standing, and none of us should countenance anything which undermines it. This quote by Eleanor is a far cry from where she started. In 1911, Eleanor shows no interest in being a part of the women's suffrage movement until she hears that Franklin has joined. Her response is, somewhat shocked, as I had never given the question serious thought. At this time, she took for granted that men were superior creatures and still knew more about politics than women. So she decides, I realize that if my husband were a suffragist, I probably must be too. In 1913, the women's suffrage movement stages a parade in conjunction with Wilson's inauguration. Eleanor can do her share of belittling when she writes to a friend. The suffrage parade was two funny and nice fat ladies with bare legs and feet exposed. After the dual crisis of the Mercer Affair and Franklin's polio, Eleanor has slowly reformed herself from a desire to appease to being authentic. The National Consumers League, the National League of Women Voters, and the National Woman's Party are just a few of the organizations Eleanor is a part of as she begins to advocate against discriminatory practices. As her own perspective of women's issues changes, she states, If we are still a negligible factor, ignored and neglected, we must be prepared to admit in what we have ourselves failed. Eleanor encourages women to stay informed so their opinions are not just a reaction to propaganda. As early as the 1920s, women had just gotten the right to vote in August 1920, Eleanor is writing articles to demand real power for women. She felt women got into politics to make things better for most people, while men got involved to play politics and win elections. Eleanor's willingness to use the media goes against her upbringing that advocates women stay out of any publicity. Eleanor recalled, It was hard for me at first. I was brought up by a very strict grandmother who thought no lady should ever have stories written about her, except in the society columns. Public opinion and male domination are slow to change, especially in light of economic downturn, the Depression. Several programs that are part of the Federal New Deal are actually a setback to the progress of women in the workplace. The National Recovery Act institutes lower wages for women. The Economy Act, in 1933, mandates that all federally employed women married to federally employed men can be fired. This means they lose all rights to reappointment and to any pension to which they have been contributing. States followed suit to increase jobs for men. The states passed laws to fire and ban women who are married school teachers, university professors, and hospital workers. Eleanor uses her radio addresses and her daily newspaper column to not only educate the women, but for them to educate her. When she starts her column, she tells her reader, I want you to write to me. 
and even if your views clash with what you believe to be my views. In six months, she receives 301,000 letters. She takes time to listen to their problems and every night answers many of the letters herself. In a 1933 press conference, she tells women, have a special stake in watching national and international news. Every woman should have a knowledge of what is going on in London. It does affect the future amicable relations between the nations of the world. It has been stated that the debt question is not to be discussed, but whatever does come out will be vitally important to every woman in her home. She advises women, get into the game and stay in it. Throwing mud from the outside won't help. Building up from the inside will. Or, too often the great decisions are originated and given form in bodies made up wholly of men, or so completely dominated by them that whatever of special value women have to offer is often shunted aside without expression. In her later years, as a UN delegate, Eleanor says, So against the odds, the women inch forward, although she declares, But I'm rather old to be carrying on this fight. American Jews Eleanor's progress toward publicly supporting the rights of Jews is also a slow process of untangling her own prejudices. In 1918, when she and Franklin are living in Washington, they are invited to a party to honor Bernard Baruch, a Jew. Eleanor writes to Sarah, I'd rather be hung than seen at the party, and afterwards writes to her, the Jew party was appalling. This is the same Bernard Baruch she later loves and admires. By 1930, she enjoys dancing with him and considers him one of the wisest and most generous people I have ever known. And she writes to him, There are few people one trusts without reservation in life, and I am deeply grateful to call you that kind of friend. The United States government must also untangle its prejudice, but it won't be in time to save the millions of Jews who are being murdered in Germany. Anti-Semitism is not the only reason for U.S. inaction. As mentioned earlier, it's awkward for our country to point an accusing finger at Germany when our own country is turning a blind eye to its African-American citizens being lynched every month. Like placating a bully, this works to Hitler's advantage. In April 1933, Hitler says, Through its immigration law, America has inhibited the unwelcome influx of such races as it has been unable to tolerate. Eleanor is hard-pressed to argue with this. Her public response is, What has happened to our country? If we study our own history, we find that we have always been ready to receive the unfortunates from other countries. And though this may seem a generous gesture on our part, we have profited a thousandfold by what they have brought us. Eleanor receives a letter in December 1933 from a woman with information of what is happening to the Jews in Germany. Eleanor writes back, Unfortunately, in my present position, I am obliged to leave all contacts with foreign governments in the hands of my husband and his advisors. If Eleanor wants to keep any inroads of communication to the president, she has to abide by the rules he has given her. Franklin has told her to stay out of international affairs. Eleanor's compliance may seem weak, but she does pass information on to Franklin. Ignoring the wisecracks and criticism from Franklin's inner circle, she follows up with a stream of notes and keeps nudging Franklin to take action. Eleanor also works within immigration laws to have Jewish children allowed into the United States. To the shame of our nation, this effort is struck down. However, nothing can strike down the determination of this First Lady. It's 1938, and the United States will not be involved in World War II for close to four more years. The U.S. is still refusing to acknowledge there are German death camps for the Jews, and Eleanor is becoming more outspoken on anti-Semitism. Where she had earlier resigned in silence from a club that excluded a Jewish friend of hers, now in 1938, discovering the country club where she is to speak has a no Jews allowed policy, she makes a public statement that she will decline the speaking engagement. 
Eleanor helps establish a home for immigrant Jewish girls in Jerusalem in 1937. In 1938, she helps promote the settlement of 1,000 Jewish refugee families. Eleanor also steps up her advocacy for tolerance by continuing to educate her reading audience. In November 1938, she writes that the present catastrophe for Jews and Gentiles alike in books, schools, newspapers, plays, assemblies, we want incessant truth-telling about these old legends that divide and antagonize and waste us. She notes that it is beyond her understanding the kind of racial and religious intolerance which is sweeping the world today. Eleanor had not always understood the desire of Jews to have their own country, Zionism. She thought they should just assimilate into the country and culture where they live. After the war, Eleanor voices her support of establishing a homeland for the Jewish people. She has realized the horror of their situation is what makes it tragic because those who are being kept out of Palestine are the waifs and strays of horror camps. And she will even say about U.S. policies, But I deplore even more the attitude of self-righteous governments. Our own government position has never gone beyond pious hopes and unctuous words. When Eleanor goes to Europe after World War II, she visits the concentration camps, She could have stayed away, aloof in formalities that are befitting a former first lady, but she wants to bear witness to what has happened. She says they were the saddest places, the Jewish camps particularly, are the things I will never forget. This anguish is overwhelming as she discovers that thousands of Jews are now being held in detention camps with other Germans. Great Britain, who is governing Palestine, wants to appease the Arabs, oil, and so has placed severe restrictions on Jews immigrating to Palestine. Eleanor says, the thought of what it must mean to those poor human beings seems almost unbearable. They have gone through so much hardship and had thought themselves free forever from Germany, the country they associate with concentration camps and crematories. Now they are back there again, Somehow it is too horrible for any of us in this country to understand. The weight of human misery here in Europe is something one can't get out of one's heart. One third of the world's Jewish population has been exterminated. For some, this wretched situation leads to a protective blank stare of disbelief because to understand this mass cruelty, one will jump off the cliff of despair. This is not Eleanor's choice. For a woman who cannot walk by a homeless person without feeling their hunger, taking in the extent of this human depravity takes broad shoulders, a large heart, and a vision that can see past this wretched evidence to a people and time that can be better. Eleanor can't get out of one's heart this memory, and it will carry her through the coming years when she makes her finest contribution to the world. Chapter 8, War Eleanor's generation fights through World War I and its sequel, World War II. No one feels assured there won't be a World War III. During World War I, Eleanor volunteers every week with the Red Cross and visits the veterans in hospitals. She sees firsthand not only the mutilated arms, legs, and faces of men, but those whose sanity has cracked under the strain of battle. She visits St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where the Navy has an installation for young men who have gone temporarily or permanently insane. Eleanor relates, It was a long ward with men, some of them in cubicles chained to their beds, and a strange sound permeating the whole place. The men were talking and mumbling to themselves, not conversation, just private thoughts revealed in an endless series of monologues. At the end of the ward, standing where the sun coming through the window touched his golden hair, stood a handsome young man. He did not see us. He saw nothing but some private vision of his own. He kept muttering. What is he saying? I asked the doctor. 
he keeps repeating the orders at Dunkirk to go to the shelters. Will he ever get over it? I don't know, the doctor said flatly. I watched the boy struggling with his private hell. After World War I, Eleanor visits cemeteries in France, witnessing the miles of parallel white markers, graves for the dead. In 25 years, at the end of World War II, she will be back again, paying her respects to more fresh graves, thousands of them. As Europe is being overrun with Nazi armies, many Americans want to stay with their isolationist stand and pacify Hitler's demands. To this, Eleanor responds, Appeasement does not work where ethics do not exist. Many of Eleanor's supporters feel betrayed by her backing the war. She tells them, I don't want to go to war, but war may come to us. When the United States is attacked at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, Eleanor's words come true, war came to us. There are still critics of the war, and they say to Eleanor, the man who goes to war for an ideal sacrifices his ideals in the process. Eleanor responds, I agree with you in theory, but I would rather die than submit to rule by Hitler and Stalin. Would not you? And another quote of Eleanor's is, I'm afraid that I'm a very realistic pacifist. We can only disarm with other nations. We cannot disarm alone. You use every means in your power to prevent a fight, and this includes giving all the assistance you possibly can short of military assistance. But if war comes to your own country, then even pacifists must stand up and fight for their beliefs. During the war, Eleanor is continuing to support causes. She pushes for government contracts for minorities. Pleased that women are being hired for factory jobs, she advocates for daycare at the facilities. To give the women time to shop for their homes, she pushes to have stores open extended hours. Her most prolific support is for the troops, and it would make even the stout of heart exhausted. Eleanor visits the troops that are fighting in the Pacific. Riding on military flights is far from first class. There is no heat, and the seating is uncomfortable. Sleeping is impossible. One trip includes all of these stops. Hawaii, Christmas Island, Penryn Island, Bora Bora, Aitutaki, Tutia, Samoa, Fiji, New Caledonia, Auckland, Wellington, and Rotorua in New Zealand, Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Rockhampton, Cairns, Brisbane in Australia, Efeiti, Espirito Santo, Guadalcanal, and Wallace. During these visits, Eleanor wants to make the most of her time. For one particular 12-hour day, she inspects two Navy hospitals, rides a boat to an officer's rest home, goes to a luncheon, inspects one Army hospital, reviews the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion, makes a speech at the service club, attends a reception, and is the guest of honor at a dinner. When she inspects a hospital, this means she greets all the patients, the kitchen staff, and officers. Service members give her letters to take back or requests for Eleanor to get in touch with their mothers. She does. To decrease formalities and simplify her wardrobe, her role on the trips is not as First Lady, but a representative of the Red Cross. Late nights are spent writing reports about facilities and conditions. These reports are sent back to the Red Cross. Before turning in, she also writes her My Day column to be wired back to the States the next morning. At one stop, she hears the troops are heading out for the front. Knowing that for many this may be their last day alive, she insists on being driven out to meet them. She walks to each truckload and wishes the boys good luck. On that day, Eleanor's unpretentious ways make her every soldier's mother. Upholding the unwritten rule, don't cry in front of the boys, she bids them each farewell, although those with Eleanor report, her voice quavered. Eleanor had written back in the summer of 1929 even about war. The loss of a generation makes itself felt acutely 20 to 35 years later, when many men who would have been leaders are not there to lead. The commander of the South Pacific, 
Admiral Halsey, thinks visits from dignitaries are nothing but a nuisance. He changes his mind when it comes to Eleanor. In his report, he states she went into every ward, stopped at every bed, and spoke with every patient. She walked for miles, and she saw patients who were grievously and gruesomely wounded. But I marveled most at their expressions as she leaned over them. It was a sight I will never forget. This crusty warrior went on to say, I was ashamed of my original surliness. She alone had accomplished more good than any other person or any other group of civilians who had passed through my area. Eleanor's genuine concern makes each visit meaningful. The following example is only one of hundreds of accounts of her personal attention to help the soldiers. At her stop on Christmas Island, she visits one young man because the doctor is worried about his will to live. She relates this in her autobiography. I made him promise that he would try to get well if I would try to see his mother on my return. I did see her, and fortunately he recovered and came to see me when he got back to the United States. Having witnessed so much pain and suffering, Eleanor's response to news that the war has ended in Europe is tempered. I cannot feel a spirit of celebration today. I am glad that our men are no longer going to be shot at and killed in Europe, but the war in the Pacific still goes on. Men are dying there, even as I write. It is far more a day of dedication for us, a day on which to promise that we will do our utmost to end war and build peace. Some of my own sons, with millions of others, are still in danger. Without definitive plans for peace, she worried more war would come. She said in her My Day column, I remembered the way the people demonstrated when the last war ended, World War I, but I felt this time that the weight of suffering which has engulfed the world during so many years could not so quickly be wiped out. Bearing in mind the emotional grief in the thousands of homes now empty of loved ones, she also reminds her readers that in the midst of celebrating the war's end, one cannot forget, however, the many, many people to whom this day will bring a keener sense of loss. For as others come home, their loved ones will not return. For these sacrifices not to be in vain, Eleanor says, the men who fought this war are entitled to a chance to build a lasting peace. The body count of American casualties in the last 80 years is 2 million. Add to this the newsreels of the Nazi death camps, which lead people to question any hope for our humanity. A wave of cynicism has people asking, so when is World War III? We have now finished part two, Awakening, and can take a moment again to assess Eleanor's life lessons to ourselves. Once again, I will use popular stories or movies as analogies. Reflections for the reader. In Rocky, the Italian stallion, bloodied from his fight, wins the real fight, which is within himself. He cries out from the boxing ring to his beloved Adrian. He doesn't care what anyone else thinks. He dares to bear his heart. Eleanor has been emotionally beat up with betrayal. Society had ringside seats, so her humiliation is public. The fight is not with Franklin or society. The battle is within herself, to be what she wants to be. In order to do this, she must first choose to let go of her victim story. Cinderella has an advantage. She is beautiful. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor said those words, and she lived up to those words. She was going to live her own way. This was more risky, since she is not Cinderella pretty. Eleanor has freed herself from the fear of society's expectations. Her continual acts of compassion some might judge foolhardy. She advocates for causes with no regard for society's scorn. The true test of character is applying the lessons learned. 
General Patton has the famous line for the United States Third Army. Now I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. You won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. Patton wanted to take the glory out of dying in war. Eleanor wanted to take the glory out of war. Part 3. Political, Public, and Personal Storms Context and Comments In a theater musical, there is often a scene where characters are singing several songs at once. The contrast of melodies representing their conflicting points of view fuels the exquisite harmony as their voices tumble and climax over each other. This artistic portrayal of the drama works beautifully on stage. If only it could be that melodious in life. Political Storms Jingo A person who is a belligerent nationalist, one who boasts of patriotism and favors an aggressive foreign policy. During the 1930s and into the late 1950s, there is legitimate concern about the worldwide spread of communism. The shrill, fear tactics of Republicans is warping the public dialogue. The lead role is Republican Senator Joe McCarthy, a jingo, claiming that communism, which had started in Russia, the Red Scare, has come to America, they infer the people are just a little bit red. Using a grim play on words, suspects are labeled pinkos. Willfully blind to inequalities in our democracy, they ignore the perspective of an African-American veteran who is returning from World War II. He has just finished fighting for freedom and democracy for a government that is now refusing his right to housing, a job, voting, or service at a restaurant. Any discussion for why communism is a viable option for disenfranchised citizens is met with indignant accusations of being un-American. With distorted innuendos and pugnacious fervor, later called McCarthyism, Senator McCarthy is scrambling to compile evidence and make his case. By dredging up outdated reports, the reputations and careers of thousands of Americans are ruined, blacklisted because old records documenting when someone attended minor activities or talked to members of the Communist Party are used as evidence of un-American activities. McCarthy puts Eleanor at the top of his list. Public Storms Quote, The crushing weight of an entire society whose masculine laws and orientations stifle the voices and the emotional needs of women is a biographer's apt description of the climate for women. Violent threats to women who choose to address the inequalities are found in the words of the play critic Nathaniel West, who writes about women, quote, what they all needed was a good rape, end quote. Not as threatening, but clearly dismissive, John Crow Ransom voices his description of the woman's role, quote, a woman lives for love. Safer as a biological organism, she remains fixed in her famous attitudes and is indifferent to intellectuality. If women express their honest opinion about sex, as Elizabeth Cady Stanton did in the late 1800s, quote, a healthy woman has as much passion as a man. Or Kate Chopin, writing about women coming to know their own physical pleasures, the public is shocked. Eleanor contends, men have to be humored, I know that men have to believe that they are superior to women, and women from the time they are little girls have to learn self-discipline because they have to please the gentleman. They have to manage some man all their lives. In this world, where women gain influence through charm and sex appeal, Eleanor and her friends refuse the role of a flapper princess, or today it would be called eye candy. Being direct in their opinions and not diminishing their intelligence, they are breaking the rules. Like throwing back the curtain from the Wizard of Oz, the entrenched boys' club doesn't appreciate being exposed. Their diversionary trick of counter-accusations, Eleanor is priggish, a she-man, cold and unforgiving, has been used by critics and historians to provide cover for the club to regroup and adjust the curtain. To this day, Current documentaries on the History Channel trot out the one quote that Eleanor supposedly said to her daughter, that sex is to be endured. If Eleanor did say this, it's quite possible it was an offhand joke or her way of inferring Franklin was a bad lover. 
Instead, this one comment is used as evidence in support of the Boys Club perspective that Franklin's philandering was Eleanor's fault. Personal storms. Aside from political attacks and Eleanor's fight to redefine herself as a woman, Eleanor must also consider her role as a mother. What would be the normal strife and conflict for a family with five children is compounded by the father's crippling disease of polio. How can the impact be measured? The children, once able to romp and tussle with their father, now take careful steps as he leans on them to walk. The children's mixed sympathies and adoration of their father is fueled by several other factors. Their doting grandmother, Sarah, continues to be Franklin's biggest fan. Society's no-fault fathering perspective is in full swing and something few families have to deal with. Their father is president. For the Roosevelt children, it is understandable they are unable to throw off such powerful blinders. However, they rarely grant Eleanor the same grace and understanding they so easily shower on their father. Eleanor takes great pains to protect the privacy of her family. Large segments of her personal correspondence have disappeared. Who can blame her? No family is without its stories they would rather not have publicized. Adam and Eve would have preferred to not have recorded one of their sons murdered the other. Information is relayed here, not as ammunition for a smug person to take verbal potshots at the family, but to show the complexities of a real life. <laughs>